Shadow work is what you do to find out what's lurking in the darkness. Dark work is what you do once you know, which is essentially the hard, unsexy, unseen, oftentimes misunderstood and actually ridiculed things that you do. And you have those late nights, early mornings, 5.30 a.m., right? And so you're successful in a way where people go, you just, you just gifted magic. No, no, no. I did this amazing work in the dark so I could shine in the light. There's going to be defining moments that show up in front of you, which challenge you. And in the old version of you, that person essentially wouldn't have the ability to stand up for themselves. But the one you've built through this dark work, they draw on something different. The mentality is, I've done too much work in the dark to lose in the light. When we are typically thinking about that future moment of that defining moment and that people go, I don't have that in me. I go, I know you don't. We don't magically have that. We earn that. So I go, you, you are picturing that future moment as the present you. But when you get to that future moment, it's the future you. You don't know that person yet. You haven't built that person yet. But I promise you that person, when they show up there and they actually have the ability to attain that, it wasn't by accident. Welcome back to the Inspired Evolution. And we have with us today, blessing our evolution, Anthony Trucks. Anthony, how are you there, brother? I'm doing well, man. How are you doing? I, that, that, you hit me out of the blue with that little thing there. <laughs> <laughs> That's, uh, yeah, well, like I said, it's it's uh, 5.30 in the morning here, so this is your yeah. dose of coffee, even though I'm the one drinking. <laughs> yeah. Got morning. My, I got my tea ready to rock. I'm, I've never had a cup of coffee, but I do tea all the time. It's my thing. Awesome. I love that. For those tuning into Anthony for the first time, guys, two secs. He's a former NFL athlete, an American Ninja Warrior on NBC. Now he's an international speaker. He's the host of the R oh Shift podcast, and he's the author of the Identity Shift book. Brother, you have been up to so much in the world, and I could not believe your origin story. I still don't really feel comfortable asking you about it because there's so much in there if I'm honest with you um a place I thought I would start was you've come across I guess a lot of mums but you've does it feel right for me to say you've had two mums and can you describe um that process is that fair enough to say or am I saying am I yeah, yeah you can that that. I would even say like three yeah cool can yeah, you explain a little bit to the audience I guess Just, yeah there's like uh so the mom situation is interesting to me, right? So it's like my kids, their experience of mom was like, I lived in my mom and my mom was raising me, right? Wasn't my experience. Like I lived in my mom and that was the one who birthed me. And then she gave me away when I was a kid at three. And then I went through a whole heinous experience as a kid. I got adopted at 14 after being with a family for eight straight years. So five houses over three years, sixth house for eight more years, adopted at 14. And that was my mom, like Gina Renee raised me but I, I didn't grow up in her body right uh she's a white woman i'm a black guy even my biological mom was white but like going out we're like oh yes mom look at look at the genes you know you can tell like just obviously i'm adopted so playing around with that and then uh you know a lot of life happened i'm sure we'll cover most of it and then my mom passed away after seven year battle with ms back in 2014 april 15th and so when she kind of you know went home it was kind of like this me floating in the world and i have since found a woman who is like she's she works kind of with me, but she's like a pseudo mom. Like she's a person I can call and kind of like, you know, talk to if I have like some thoughts or ideas uh, or like someone she'd like to, you know, vent to, we'll call it. And so that's kind of like the third mom, we'll call it. But yeah, it's it's so my relationship with the mom where it's different than most human beings because I don't, I don't emotionally have the same connection to it that my kids do because I didn't grow up with my mom or some that wasn't adopted or, you know, any in that kind of manner. It's just, a, it's a, it's a person that holds a place in my life. And always have a spot, like even my biological mom, while I don't like her, like I have an appreciation for her and what she did to bring me into this world, right? But it's just a different connection for sure. Yeah, how did that, that must have been so, because feeling into just how much of our childhood predicates and those that are listening to this podcast know you know, they've listened to enough of these conversations around epigenetics, et cetera, et cetera. Like, you know, the Jesuit said, you give me the boy before the age of seven and I'll show you the man, you know? Um, and so 
yeah, how much does, yeah, just having such a, because the mother bond, especially, and you know, I've got a two-year-old, so there's this interesting, like, boys are their mother's boys, and then, like, daughters are their daddy's girls, you know, there's a little bit of that, and I think there's some deep truth in that, but, um, sure. yeah, how does it, like, uh, it's I can't imagine, spot, man. Because yeah. I, I guarantee if you saw me at six or seven, I am not the guy you think I would be. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, statistically, if you look at any prison in America, 75% of the inmates are former foster kids like me. Half the homeless population in America spend time in foster care. Less than 1% of foster kids like me graduate from university or college. So statistically, it doesn't. it's a complete abnormal thing. Playing in the NFL like I did, that's a point zero 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 percent of people, you know, like, so it's... I'm a legitimate statistical, like super outlier in that aspect. And then also like, yeah, I was just a, I was a crazy little kid. And, and so the dynamics of what raised me, I don't know, at some point I just clicked into like, I want to do what's right, even if I don't feel good doing it, you know, because a lot of things we know are right, but they don't feel fun to do, but I knew it was right. I wanted to be right. So I would do those things. I think it was a big kind of lean in, but you are right. Cause I'm looking at like my kids, like I have a son who's 19, he'll be 19 Friday. I have 14 year old twins. And, you know, on this whole kind of journey is like my oldest son, he's like, he's my son, he's my guy, you know, but he's also like, he's, he's mama's boy. Like he's, his mom, we're close, but we're all, we're all close in that manner. You know, like our family's a unit's tight. My daughter, you know, she, she loves me and I have a good relationship as a father and daughter should, you know, but it's not like I'm her best friend. Uh, but like her mom and her are real close, even more now as she's kind of getting into her age of teens and, the, you know, the things she's navigating. Uh, but my 14 year old son, me and him are always battling because he just, he just wants to be a you know, a leaf in the wind and float around. I'm like, that's cool. Like you can, you can do that, but you have to earn that. <laughs> like you can't just, you got to take care of certain things to build those skill sets. So we know you have them when you need them. And then later on, if you've got through certain stages of life and maybe you go to college, if you don't, and you want to create a life for yourself, that's that by all means do that. But I, as a dad have to prepare you for that. So I don't know if he's like a father's son or, a, you know, a, a mother's son in, in any aspect just yet. He's just him. So they're, they're all different, unique human beings, but it's uh, it's interesting because I'm I'm teaching them, not from experience, right? Because because I my kids my guests will parent from experience, right? Meaning, they'll have experience of mom and dad in the house and married and together, and even on top of that, me and my wife, you know, we're high school sweethearts. Had had a kid at 20 years old, which is my oldest son. We were divorced for three years, remarried seven years ago. You know, we got a whole crazy story too, and and so they're gonna but they're gonna learn from like from that. Whereas for me, I'm just going off the cuff. I'm like, well, this feels right. Or I've heard this or watch this on a show or, you know, and so I'm infusing these things into what I feel at the core is the right thing for them. But none of us are right or wrong. We're just doing what we do. And so it's, it's interesting to kind of, I'm, I'm curious to see years from now, like how they turn out, you know, what they become, who they become more so too. Yeah. It's an interesting journey. The, the parenting piece was a really big piece. It taught me like there is no right and wrong that everyone's just, trying to do what they can right um yeah man all different in, puzzles leaning back into your own relationship with that how did you did you feel not wanted oh, of course age? man like that must yeah. have been such a deep wound to try and reconcile yeah. growing up yeah I mean, I mean anybody that has uh, you know, relationship, especially young age, and you're bonding, like you have trust being built. And I don't think you even know to call it trust yet. It's just this human connection. And so, yeah, if the person that you love the most, because it's the only person around taking care of you, feeding you, right? Uh, they don't love you, right? And they they make it actionable by giving you away. Oh, yeah, there's a, in my early 30s, I had a lot of internal like stuff. Like I used to play in the NFL and question if I deserved it or belonged there, you know? Well, mom didn't want me as a kid. Like what makes me think I belong here? And that's, while you logically you go like that's stupid, you know the heart doesn't work with logic. <laughs> that that that's not there's not a, a, like a brain down there. It's just like this, you know, this emotional feeling of just separation. And, and and if you can't, I found that for me, if I can't logically make sense of it, it just would stick. And so it took me a lot of years to logically make sense of the situation, to forgive, to find peace, to worry out. No, I can I can talk to it. I know how I felt in that place, but I don't harbor that anymore. I've often found that with the Inspired Evolution, when I'm interviewing people that have achieved some really amazing things, their biggest challenges have often left, led, sorry, to their biggest gifts. And I guess tuning into just, yeah, how challenging that would have been 
Um, like you said, even going in your thirties and feeling displaced when you literally earned your way, served your way into something, and then you still can't, your heart can't sink into it. Um, was it around then that it started to precipitate that this was something to do with identity? Like, when did identity as a piece start to precipitate for you? Yeah, what, run us through the 20, timeline a little bit. I think early twenty seventeen. I think early twenty seventeen is when it happened. Because I'd spent a few years, like, kind of realizing that there was a moment in time when I'd navigated crazy, went through some stuff, and then I kind of found a way out of the hole, we'll call it, and started building a life back. And in the process, I had this brand called Trust or Hustle. I realized at any stage in my life where I'd actually created something cool, like, I just leaned in and trusted me, right? With the muscle you build through action over time. So that was the brand. And then I sat in this meeting with a bunch of guys stateside you know in the united states of a, a, a bunch of good amazing minds and i'm uh, what some of them were there like ones like brendan Burchard, dean graciosi russell brunson um, jeff walker if you know these guys i'm not sure but these amazing humans and we're at this uh, jackson hole wyoming we're around a campfire and i got lewis house on my right and trent shelton he could eat cookies on my left and we're off in this, this chat and so you know you pretty much share your situation what you got going on and then you have the you know the the crew kind of chimes in their thoughts so I tell my story and I get to the end and I go, my brand's called Trust or Hustle. And a guy that's there named Ethan Willis, he's one of Brennan's business partners. He goes, I don't like it. And I go, uh, what? What do you mean? Like, this is my, <laughs> this is my life, man. What do you mean? I don't like this. <laughs> kind of we can smokes. be tender about these things, can't we? <laughs> They're our babies. <laughs> yeah. I'm going like, your baby's ugly. Like, whoa, bro, hold on a second. What do you mean by <laughs> uh, so I had that feeling and I go, well, hold on. No. And, and at this time was in the space where I could, I could receive without the ego getting in the way. So I go, well, what do you mean? And he says, well, in the world of what we do, there's always a message and a messenger. He says, the message is the thing that can change a, a life and change millions of lives. But if it's the wrong messenger, the message dies. He says, then some people are phenomenal messengers, the skill, the charisma, the ability to bring a message to the world. But if they have the wrong message, their skill set's wasted. So you have to have the right message and the right messenger. And he says, I sit and listen to you. He's like, I, I see you're the messenger. You've got it. You, everything that we, the person would, he's like, you got the skills to do this and the, and the heart and everything. He says, but the message, he's like, I don't, I don't think it's the message. He says, all of us here hustle. We all hustle. Like he's like, so it's kind of like, yeah, he says, but to navigate what you do with foster care and to go from foster care through to, you know, navigating college and then having a kid and then the NFL and then leaving the NFL and that's a big identity crisis for a lot of people and then he says then get divorced and remarried your ex like all he's like all these things you've done he's like most people in their lives won't navigate a single one of these identity shifts and they'll, they'll be stuck there for a lifetime he goes I want to know how you navigated those identity shifts and then how'd you get in this room with us like how are you here <laughs> it's not supposed to be that and I go man it's a great question and so I, I had to take that back and chew on it because I had a whole brand and logos and speeches and curriculum and courses for Trust Your Hustle. And now I'm contemplating throwing all of it away to start from scratch because this message could be a better fit for the messenger. And the only thing when I got to the nuts and bolts of it that would have stopped it would have been my ego and my attachment it wasn't, wasn't supposed to be. So I go, cool. All right. I, my gut of guts tells me it's a thing. Let's do it. So I actually made an identity shift business wise. <laughs> around the identity shift. Sorry. Right. <laughs> right. And it blossomed. It's, it's been an amazing, fun journey to see. There's so much more coming out with it. Uh, we haven't even fully launched the, the new iteration because it's been identity shift for so long. And we've done some good work there, great work. But we found that the, the fire hasn't caught. And I go, what is it? In our world, a lot of the messaging matters. And so we found that dark work somehow popped out as this thing that people go, ooh, it's intriguing, it's sexy, it's unique, it, get, it gives a sense of pride to when you've done this stuff. And so we've honed the brand down language-wise to that, but it's still the same essence of doing identity work. Mm. I do want to find out the identity shift process because I, when I reached into that, and it's quite robust, but we're touching the topic. So what is dark work? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you've heard of shadow work. I'm sure you have in the world of what you do. The way I can simplify the separation is shadow work is what you do to find out what's lurking in the darkness, right? What's going on back there. Dark work is what you do once you know. And the purpose of it is for you to realize that everything we've done in life, who we are to this point, it's all happened with dark work, which is essentially the hard 
unsexy, unseen, sometimes, oftentimes misunderstood and actually ridiculed things that you do. People make fun of you, they poke, they prod. Who are you to think you can start a podcast? Those things, right? But you still do it. And you have those late nights, those early mornings, 5.30 a.m., right? And you're doing this stuff. And so you're successful in a way where people go, it just, you just gifted magic. No, no, no. I did this amazing work in the dark so I could shine in the light. And, and what the, when you shine the light, you're shining in what I call defining moments, which is a moment comes to pass and you're now challenged. And what I look at it as is I go, I want to have this, what I call a dark work mentality. We call it a dominator's identity, which is I've done too much work in the dark to lose in the light. I've built, I've toiled, I've trebled, I've read, I've done the work. I'm not going to lose this relationship, this business, this sense of self, that whatever this, I'm not going to lose this moment because I've already earned it in the past. I've earned it in the dark. And so dark work is the things you do to, to build. Now, when you tie it to identity, people go, well, how's it tied to identity? And I go, well, identity is just a neurological impact and psychological wiring. It's a way we were wired to become who we are. And realistically, it happened through experiences. That's simple, right? A dog comes in a room and it bites you and it doesn't bite me. Well, you're all of a sudden through experience going like, I hate dogs. And I go, oh, dog, right? The experience is only separation to it. Same dog, same situation. And so I go, oh, well, if that's the case, we're all wired to this moment in time. It happened from experiences, relationship experiences, career experiences. It's like we mentioned to your whole situation prior to starting this podcast, right? There was an experience you went through that goes, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something else. And then you stepped into this and you stepped into it ugly. And what you did is you just started stacking experiences. Yes, I'm saying that because I know it. it's the case for everybody because you're human, right? And what happens is we start this process and you start doing things uncomfortably and difficult. And it's ridiculed. Nobody gets it. But what you do is you keep doing it. And you start stacking this dark work. And little by little by little, you put yourself through an experience without even knowing it. This experience rewires you neurologically and psychologically. So now you think different, you process different, you experience different. The filter of the world's completely different from what it was, all because of the experience you subjected yourself to. So when I call it a dark work experience, most people have one of two ways to go through that kind of experience. They do it on demand, they choose to do it, or when crap hits the fan. It's like, I'm down with this. This sucks. I can't do it anymore, right? I go, oh, and all of a sudden, you find this amazingness. Or you go, I want something more. I don't want to, I want to attain or I want to sustain something greater in my life. You can't do it unless you have an identity that matches that habits, patterns, actions, right? So you have to go through dark work to develop the habits, the patterns, the actions, the perspectives to do what's necessary to have what you want in life. It's really profound hearing what you're sharing because I, in the inspired evolution approach to things for a long while, um, I would say for the first four and a half years, was dedicated to absolutely we all have crap that's holding us back and there's plenty of things that are bringing this down and plenty of messages that are like, you know, you could be better, you know, playing on our fears. Um, and I was just championing positivity to the, not from a toxic place, but like recognizing that we have all these challenges, but then also you've got a lot of strengths, like double down on your strengths. Right. And that was the vibe here at Inspired Evolution. It was like, absolutely. Like you've got some stuff and I totally wholeheartedly acknowledge that. But if you just push forward towards your strengths a little, you have a look at them. It makes it easier to tolerate some of the icky bits that are in the dark, in the shadow, because it's like, actually I can shine this much light onto it. Right. Um, and I was championing that for a long time and it wasn't up until I actually had my first son and I started running into the lack of sleep. <laughs> it was real grounded. Yeah. Real practical. And I noticed this thing happened where, because with, when you start losing sleep, there's this wall of resilience that you've also got. And I didn't really, ident I didn't have this palpable taste for resilience, but you know, the wall of resilience started coming down as my lack of sleep started coming down. And I didn't realize that the wall of resilience was almost like this gate that was like holding back some things like damming back some energy, right? And what I would find when I was like compromised from sleep, like sleeping one, two hours a day, all broken and stuff, people would come and ask me like a normal sort of question. And, you know, in some, and I can, in people's mind, I'm Mr. Inspired Evolution in some ways. I'm meant to be like, you know, positive, personal development, kind, loving. And uh, people are like, oh, you know, where's such and such? And it's like, do I look like a tour guide? <laughs> it's like, whoa, whoa. And I'm looking at myself going, 
well, <laughs> like, where did that come from? And I started to recognize sitting with it because I still kept my main meditation practice, which is as the as the walls came down, what it was damning back was, you know, you call it dark work, my shadows. I could see that, that like my shadows were previously behind this wall of resilience and I'd learned to modulate them. But as soon as I lost like the resilience piece, they were just jumping over the fence left, right and center. And only then did I really realize how much bandwidth was spent even in day-to-day living, just sort of not having addressed this body of work. And there began this whole journey of like, absolutely. And, you know, I think it's important for everybody to work on their light, but I also think it's important to work on our shadows and our dark as well. And the, the key thing it helps with is resilience. Is that what you would th- what, what what you would say? Or? I mean, I think resilience is what you what you have in the moments based on what you choose to do in the moment, right? Do I have something here that I can push through and do I choose to push through? And no matter what the work is, whether it's working on the shadows, working on light, it's still dark work. It's just dark work's just it's work behind the scenes, man. That's what it is. Just work you're being being done that, that you're not doing it for high fives and handshakes and clapping. My son just yesterday is in college and he's like, hey, I just did like five hours of work. He's like, look at this lab. And he's scrolling and I go, that's awesome. I'm gonna tell you right now, son, I don't really care about it. I said, I, I care that you did it. And I'm super proud of you for getting it done, but that's for you. Like that's, and I'm not diminishing a moment of that, but you're going to have a a life full of these kind of things where you do all this work and only you're going to know. But when you show up to that test or you show up to a situation, you'll know. So you'll do what you need to do to get the A, to pass the test, to get that thing, right? There's a lot of people that will shortcut that, cut the corners on it. So no matter what it is, it's it's the work you do that's for you that gives you that sense of, like you said, pride, resilience, push through. because. I, I, usually when you see somebody push through a problem, you go, man, they were resilient. They persevered. And I go, that's a good way for me to describe that. But I don't know if that's always going to be the language I would use. Part of it, when I when I get into situations and it's a battle, the, the thought of like me, per, I don't say I'm going to persevere through that. I don't say that. I just get the thing done. Because in my head, I'm like, ain't no way. I'm Anthony Trucks. What the hell? Like, this gets done. You know, like, this ain't even a question. Let's go. Like, you lining me up? Let's go to work, right? You would describe that as a good mindset, as perseverance, as resilience. I just go, that's how I handle that kind of problem. That's just, that's Anthony Trucks. That's an identity trait for me. And so I think we put labels on describing other people's things, but most of the time, like, I don't think Kobe Bryant, who people know is a, you know, American basketball player, is amazing mind, like, just had his good mama mentality. I don't know how much I ever heard him talk about his, my, my mindset was this, and I was resilient in this way, or I persevered. He's like, no, I made a contract with myself. And he said, I got to get up at six in the morning. I got up at six in the morning. That's what I did. He didn't describe it as being resilient. The this is what he did, right? It was an identity trait. And I go, that's what people need to find more. It's like you do something so much where you're not describing it as a trait. And it's not even at, at a certain point. Well, in the beginning, it's super hard to do a lot of these things. We're talking the work is hard. After a while, it gets hard not to do it. When it's so much who you are that like, yeah, it still takes effort, but like, I can't go to sleep unless I get that done. It, it'd be hard not to do that thing. And six months ago, the thought of it made me want to throw up, right? But that's where you start developing this level of, of identity that rises, and I say shifts, to raise all things that come to pass. But a lot of it is, yeah, it's whether it's light work, dark work, whatever it is, it's going to be work, and it's just stuff that nobody else is giving you a high five for. I can see two paths going down this conversation right now. Let's make it practical for those that are tuning in. I have tuned into there's about seven steps on the, the identity shift process. How do you invite people into shifting their identity? Because I've got a very dear friend in my ecosystem at the moment. He, you know, entrepreneur, incredible startup that he started and, you know, went through a few rounds of funding and fast forward two years later, he's now, you know, working for a corporate organization. He's really struggling with that. Um, even though, his plan B is most people's people would kill to have that as their plan A. And I consistently get messages from him. He's like, man, this is fucked. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I totally get it. But at the same time, like, you know, just remember, and I'm find myself, you know, just cajoling him along a little bit, which is like, Hey, you know, like I said to you, he's like, you know, your plan B is most people's plan A and just take a breather. It's just a moment in time. And he's like, something's up because this is actually impacting how I feel about myself and I can feel it impacting my identity um you know and he can and he's cognizant enough to sort of be like 
I don't, you know, what do I do from this juncture? So he feels very stuck. How do you help people get unstuck when it comes to real estate? Uh, well, he's already doing one thing, which is good. He's talking about it. Some people get uh, tucked in the space of convincing themselves because it would be great for somebody else. I must be crazy. How could I want more than this? I'm, it's just something wrong with me. And then you actually battle that internal voice that is telling you, you should, you want more, but because other people would be satisfied, you should be too. I go, when has that ever been like a human thing we should be doing? So I think the fact that he's talking to you first is a good thing. Uh, the way that I look at it is you have to give yourself permission to want more. And I know as much as people, they, they want more, we sometimes undermine it. Like we will say like, we like, oh, I don't want to say it. It's, it's bad to say that I want more money. But do you want more money? Yeah. Well, then just say it. What are you, what are you talking about? Like, it's bad to say I want more sex in a marriage. But do you want it? Yeah. Then ask for it. What are you talking about? What, do you want that? Like, it's, it's like, so, so we're trying to turn off our desires, which is very interesting. Because to turn off the desire, you're turning off the gas to the engine that makes it run. Like, the reason a lot of us move is the desire. I, there's certain things that I don't love doing in my career but I desire what the outcomes are, the time with my family, I get to upgrade my house. I'm excited for that. And so for me, like I, I, I tell myself, like, and I tell the world, I want to make as much money as possible because in doing so, I create a cool life. Now, how I make money is different, right? I believe you have to give value to the world and the world will reciprocate you with, with money if you want that. But I want, to, I want a great value. I want people to be thankful to give me money whenever I serve them, right? Because I do such a damn good job. But but I wouldn't focus on that if I tried to say, oh, I don't, I don't want anybody to know I want money. Why do, why do we do that, right? So when you say you want something, accept and appreciate and embrace what you want. And if people around you make you feel small for that, get better people. That's it. Get better minds who think at a level where you want to be. Because most of the time, the reason you feel that way is because somebody told you you shouldn't feel that way, right? Or you shouldn't have that thing. And so like, that's not my people. So find the right people. Once it's up there, you start uh, you start opening yourself to opportunities to do things that make your stomach twist. And you probably go, what does that mean? I go, well, if there's something you want more of, it's because you haven't been doing more of something. So whatever that thing is, the action, the habit, the big action, the big ask, whenever it is, that's going to put your stomach in knots because it's not what your current identity does. If it was, you'd already be having that thing. So, for example, I'm sure when you go like, I, I just know that I don't want to do this career. I'm just, you know, building sky rises. I don't want to, I want to have this podcast. You go, okay, I want to do it. I'm sure the first thought of recording the first episode or like posting it, like there's these knots. It probably took way longer than it was supposed to take because like you didn't, you know, the feedback of what might take place. Your stomach is just twisted. But now it's like, well, I can't wait to get on and record. I got the backdrop, the lights, you know, like you're excited to do it. How did that happen? Oh, well, because you stepped in uncomfortably. You did this thing that was not within your identity, traits in the beginning, and you said, okay, I want this. And you started framing up steps of what it looked like and took them. Now, for me, the process at that point, I call it, it's what we call a dark work experience. There's three steps to it. Once we've cleared past the I want this thing stage, which is usually I'm not always part of that. I don't want to make you want something. I can. It's not even smart for a person to want more for someone than they want for themselves. Because if I want more than you want for yourself, I'm going to make you feel bad because you don't want what I say you should want, right? So mm. I'm not part of that. And it's Once disingenuous go, for the person that's, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah no, it is, 100%. My, you know, in your marriage, I had my marriage. My wife and I talk about our marriage all the time. I, I do podcasts. She doesn't do what I do. So I've, I've been asked to be on national television many times to talk about our marriage because of the cool things we went through. And she's like, I don't want to do it. In the beginning, I'm like, why would you not want to do it? It could be good for my, my business, and Right. She didn't want to do it. And I go, after a while, I go, if I, I'm, trying, I'm wanting more for her than she wants for her. And so it started causing a riff. And I go, well, what do I really want? I want a happy wife. And if I desire a happy wife, that means that I don't do this. And even if I got this, I'd have an unhappy wife. So I don't want to, I don't want to do it. So I'm like, all right, so she doesn't want to do it. We're not doing it. And that's cool. I have no problem with that now. Mm -hmm. But the framing of it was big, right? But again, okay, none of the wants. Now I go, okay, somebody comes to me and goes, and I want this. I go, great. We got to respect the light. It's the first step of the whole process. Respecting the light is like, if I'm going to do this dark work, what's the light that I want to shine in? If I don't desire that, if I don't frame that, I don't connect to it. When things get hard, I won't push or I won't start in the first place. So respecting the light comes out of three things you respect. You respect what the actual vision is, which is a big piece of it. Most people will not get clarity on this. They'll just go like, I want more money. I want more time. I want... 
How much more time do you want? A week? A month? How much more money do you want? A thousand? Twenty thousand? A hundred thousand? What do you want? Because what happens is you don't clarify it. And when you don't clarify it, it keeps you safe because it doesn't challenge you to do something really uncomfortable because it's arbitrary. But if you go, look, I want to make another million dollars. Oh, <laughs> all right. That's a big ass. If you go, I want to make another 20 bucks. Okay, cool. But those are both more money, right? So delineating is a big thing people don't like to do because it makes it real. So first, what is it you want? Second thing is respect someone who has it that you might not like who has it. And people go, what do you mean? I go, there's a lot of people that we look at living a life we want to live. And I go, I hate the way their hair is. Oh, I would never do that with my husband. I, they, their kids are, you know, I wouldn't do it that with my, that's, that's fine. That's fine. But you like their house and their car and the, the career success they have, right? Yeah. Okay, well, if you diminish everything, you close off your ability to access what they have done that you could do to get to a similar height. You may not do the way they've done it, but you do want to have the options that they have. So pause the, the judging, right? Step back, lower the ego and go, all right, what can I extract? Okay, well, you know what? They did do this every single day for the last 10 years, right? They have made this ass. They did develop relations. They did these little things. You start noticing, go, okay, okay I'm going to do it. And that starts to inform you of the third thing of the light you respect, the work that you have to do. And people every day are aware of things they should do and just don't do them. And most of the time, it's because either they're afraid of it or it doesn't feel like it's who they are to do that thing. And so what I've laid out in the beginning before I even go into designing act, like actions and habits and everything, I want to figure out what do you want, who has it, you can look at and borrow some ideas. And three, what is your, this is where you would call it shadow work, right? This is the actual part of shadow. Let's dive in and see what your areas of, uh, of opportunity are that there's been no light cast on it. Because if you, and because respect, I, I, it's, it's to have admiration for. It's why I chose that word. I want to have admiration for the dream admiration for what somebody did to get an admiration for what I have as an opportunity to improve myself, the growth I can have. Cause some people go like, I want to start a business. Oh, but you know what? But I don't like um, doing sales and I don't like um, working on technology. I don't like social media. Great. I'm sure you don't like it, but you're going to get good at it. If you want to have a business nowadays. Right. And while you may not identify with it as a human, that's just because you haven't done it enough. And so what you do is you stop using that kind of language and go, okay, I have to work on, understanding social media strategy. I have to work on my sales ability. I have to work on serving people, or whatever it is. But if that's your work to do, that's the work you got to do. And it's that's going to be the most uncomfortable, gut-wrenching stuff you do in the process because that's the stuff that creates the outcome you want. I find the... Um, steps, we haven't gotten that far yet, but... So okay. go, what we you saying? No, no. If you, I just I was giving us a moment to pause because I, I can talk forever. It's what I do for a living. <laughs> um, <laughs> There's two more steps to it, but I don't I don't want to dive into those unless you're ready to move on to them. Yeah, I do want to move into the two steps. The um, just one of the things that was present for me was the permission piece, um, especially because you touched off on the word admiration, and I can see how deeply woven in that word really is when you're describing giving ourselves permission to touch into our desires and really giving ourselves and even just the the piece where it's like look at someone that's done what you've wanted to achieve and then like you can feel that right there's like this i don't want to say toxicity but there's this like judging and like, mm, they're like this and they're like that um and we're basically not giving ourselves permission so i do want to dive into the other two steps but i just sort of wanted to if we can take a quick little tangent um because permission admir permission lies on both sides of um the admiration uh from what i'm listening into here because usually we resist to give ourselves permission to be able to be like, oh, I actually genuinely like that about what that person's created in their life and I'm like that. And then the other piece on the other side of it is like, I do like it and I'm worthy of going out and getting that myself as well. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. Can There's you discuss the permission piece with us? Yeah, I think, so I battled this, right? I got into the speaking world and doing my thing and I'm like, I'm better than that guy. How do you get on the stage? And, you know, and he sucks. And, you say that, and then you fail to comprehend there's a lot of things that are doing to get them in that position. And so I had to take a step back and, and swallow my pride, put the ego away, and go, where can I learn, right? So part of it is because what happens for a lot of us is no one likes to feel bad about themselves. So we do one of two things. We either, when we see somebody, we do one of two things. We see somebody at a level we'd like to be at. We can do the elevate thing, which starts with me going, I am lacking in some area. I must improve because they're doing better. Let me work to raise myself up. 
that is not the go-to for 99% of people. Not, not the default go-to. mode network. <laughs> well, exactly. The DIA default mode. That's, that's actually a part of the brain. Yeah, that's part of the brain stuff. It's actually part of this identity work I've done. Um, but on the other side of the coin, it's like what most people do. It's what you see in like movies and stuff like, who does she think she is? You know? And so we, we do these things to tear people down to bring them down to our level so I can raise up to the level or bring them down to, the, to my level. And most people, it's easier to bring them down to my level, diminish them, you know, downplay the, the benefit and, and just bring it down to, to, to eye level. The problem at this thing is that you have now diminished the dream that you have and you can't reconcile with that. And that's why you struggle when you have this internal tension because you want this thing, you see them have it, but you're diminishing them for having it. So maybe I shouldn't have it, but I do want, it's just this spinning cycle. And so people are torturing themselves because they are diminishing people doing amazing things. So for me, I go, stop doing that. Like what they're doing is just, it's them doing it. And I don't care if, if they're one person doing it, the world's got billions of people that could only listen to you, if, but you got to put your voice out there, right? So the other side is going like, okay, I can do that. The permission part you talked about and giving yourself grace to do it. This is where the other part of comparison comes in. Say you do tell yourself, all right, I see what they did and I have respect for that, but man, I don't know if I could ever do that. I don't know if it's for me. I don't know. It wasn't for them. They didn't know if they could do it. They were a baby at one point. They were pooping in diapers, you know, like they were, they were just, just like you. And all you have to do is go back and go, well, well, what were the things that they did? Well, they started ugly and they built. It's taken years. And you, you don't have to compare yourself to them. And you also don't have to promise the same thing they're promising, right? If you want to go serve or do something. Like in my world, people go like, man, I, you do such the high level stuff. I go, yeah, but I'm really only promising that a level that I feel comfortable. There's people that do way more than me. But also, there's a lot of people that are 17 steps behind where you were at. So you don't got to promise where I'm at, promise where you're at and serve the people that are said this is the place you used to be. And that's kind of how you progress through life. And so the permission thing is most people just don't want to get started because they're comparing themselves to other people that are 70, you know, steps ahead of them. And the truth is they were always at square one like you all, so they just started. And so if you can give yourself permission to start going, as well as permission to improve prior to that, you start opening the doors for the possibility of your success. There's no guarantee, but it's, a, it's a, an ever-increasing possibility when every day you wake up giving action in that direction. Thank you so much for addressing that. Weaving back in. Step two, yeah. step three. <laughs> Let's go. Step two, man. Step two is just dark work. It's it's we or do the dark work. It's we we're still playing with language, but I just call it the dark work. And within that, there are steps also. This is where you get down and used to do the stuff. The previous I feel like steps. The rubber gloves are coming on. <laughs> I can yeah, feel it already. They're coming up to my elbow. Because yeah. so the prior stuff, when we get down to the steps of it, we're we're crafting visions. We're unpacking ten areas of life. Like it's it's clear what you want, why you want it, what it's going to look like when you get it. It's going to be clear what the actions are, the habits are, the reactions you'll have, the drivers. Like there's so much done. It's crystal clear. You can look at it and go, if I was just to do this for a long time, I'd have what I want. I'd become who I want to become. But you got to do it, right? And so we do is the second part is doing the dark work. And the first part of that is we call it designing your dark. And that's where you actually get down and you will strategically design your dark work, like to the minutes, right? And it may not be your entire day. Maybe, you know, once a week you have a dark work day, totally okay. Maybe once a day you have dark work windows, like is an hour here, an hour there, cool. Maybe do a dark work week or weekend, like it, whatever it is, it's just, it's you choosing when you want to apply this, this time where you pretty much shut down your access to the rest of the world and you just do it for you and you tuck away. And for me, I do it every day. I have windows of time where it's like everything's off, let's lock in. And I go to work and then I pop up and hang out with cool people like yourself, right? So there's this, this weight that's woven in. And so the, you design that thing. And it's going to be something that it should be hard every day. Like you, the first day you wake up, it's not like this, yay. <laughs> it's not a joyous <laughs> thing. Today's the dark work day. <laughs> it's, we have a, it's, it's called light, L-I-G-H-T, we go through every single day. But within that, it's like morning routines and it's, you know, it's identity work and it's, it's doing gratitude and it's doing healthy choices. It's having a way you track these things. We call it tree tasks. There's these little nuances, but you're doing it every day and every day is not fun. It is a challenge, but we set you up to have success with it little by little. And the more you do, the more it goes from being the first week sucks, second week sucks, third week, okay, fourth week, all right. By the time you get to that last week, it's like, I can't imagine not doing this. 
it'd be harder not to do it. And on the same token, while doing it, you accomplish something, right? So you design what that's going to be. You then do what I call a declaration, a dark work declaration. So based on the window of time you'll work, you write down what you're going to read when you exit. So you'll be able to say, like, in this dark work window I did for the last 90 days, I did this, I did this, I did this. And it should be something where you left some things off because you did so much more than you thought you would do. But I want you to write that down because as you're going through the day, when you do exit the third step, you're going to read this to the world. And you'd better not be lying. So we actually do this dark work declaration, and then we go dark. You you give yourself that star. I call it an action day. There's an action day. You go dark. There's not the the cameras in your in your room when you're working. Because here's the thing people don't realize. If you want to be productive and effective and efficient, there's something we have called motor or mirror neurons. There's a lot of ways they show up in how our brain works. One way is that we'll mirror somebody's thoughts or feelings. So like if I stub my toe, you'd be like, oof, right? Because you watch me do it. So you can imagine what it feels like. It's just the way the brain mirrors that. Well, what happens is if you put somebody in a room by themselves and work, there'll be a certain level of effectiveness and efficiency and productivity. If you put someone in the room, just put them in the room. Don't even talk to them. Just put them over there. They they diminish their effectiveness, efficiency, and productivity because they're going, am I taking my pen too much? Do I smell? Does that person smell? Are they breathing like that? Their shoes. Subconscious, and you just, it's running through your head. It's hard to tune that person out. And so it diminishes your pure focus on the task at hand. And so when a lot of people go, but in, I'm by myself in my house. Yeah, but you got a tripod popped up and you're filming yourself right. You know, it's like you're making content. There's nothing wrong with that. There's a window of time to do that. But when you're really hunkered down and doing your work, you become the most dominant version of you. There's a reason we know of David Goggins, Wim Hof, uh, you know, Tony Robbins, these people that, where was Wim Hof 20 years ago? Dude was out in the woods, you know, and, and was doing dark work. No, he, there, was, there was no camera with him. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Where was Goggins? He's probably running on the moon. We don't know. Like, we just, <laughs> stuff you know what i'm saying so what happens is they were just out there and then they they did that work and then when they came back they had developed this mentality this dominator's identity when i say dominator what it means by definition is to govern and control it's not this dominant so you can govern and control your meditation routine you can dominate that it sounds weird but i want that to be a clarity point but that's what happens you tuck away and then when you emerge which is the third part you emerge you go into the world and you do two things. One, you compete for what you fought for with conviction. You go after that thing you've been, you've been planning to do. So you read your declaration. So you actually read the dark declaration out loud. You then compete, which means you go after and put yourself in the position to get the job, to get the girl, to get that, whatever it is, right? You do it because you were preparing for it. Most people do this work and they kind of get to the moment of it and they go, I don't know, they shy away. I go, no, we're leading into this. Let's go get that job. Let's go start that business, right? So you actually do that. And the last thing you do, which is a, it's more of the ongoing, is you D-O-Y-D, draw on your darkness. There's going to be defining moments that show up in front of you, which challenge you. And in the old version of you, that person essentially wouldn't have the ability to stand up for themselves. But the one you've built through this dark work, they draw on something different. They hunker down. They, they sink their feet because the mentality is, I've done too much work in the dark to lose in the light. I, this is mine right now. They're drawing from a different place of the hours spent, the time put in, the conversations, the loss, the sacrifice given. They're drawing on something different and they push. And those individuals are the ones that be able to have amazing lives we see everywhere. And most people go, I couldn't do that. It'd be too hard to have. And if I get there, like, I don't know if I can sustain that. And I go, listen, the world doesn't make mistakes in that manner. When we are typically thinking about that future moment of that defining moment and that how the mentality is, people go, I don't have that in me. I go, I know you don't. That's, you, you don't we don't magically have that. We earn that. So I go, you, you are picturing that future moment as the present you. But when you get to that future moment, it's the future you. And you don't know that person yet. You haven't built that person yet. But I promise you that person, when they show up there and they actually have the ability to attain that, it wasn't by accident. It was by effort. They earned it. So don't don't base a future decision on current now. Base it on future you. And then start action, like taking action towards that. There's something insidiously cool. Insidious is probably not the right word, but um 
tucked in there because I'm recognizing that if I, even if I flaked around on what I did in step one, um, and created something that wasn't completely authentic to myself, I wouldn't show up for step two unless it really fucking mattered to me. <laughs> for real. hundred percent. You wouldn't plan and structure. No, nobody would. Yeah. And yeah. going in to do the deep, dark work around something that, you know, cause I don't know, maybe I'm, I'm unique. Maybe you can reflect on this through the work you've done with thousands of individuals. If it doesn't really matter to me, I find it really hard to buckle down and do the work behind the scenes. That's true. Because 100%. it's, yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. universal. Oh, yeah. Is that? I think so. I mean, if I tell you, hey, go hike this mountain, why? Because there's a, a stale Cheerio at the top of that. I don't, what? I don't want to go. <laughs> but it's like, there's a, a box full of gold bullion. Like, oh, let's go hiking, you know? Yeah, you, nobody's in a move. They don't want it. And, and if, if somebody's telling you you should, it's even worse. Because <clears throat> then you're doing it for somebody else and it's not your thing. But that's why in the beginning for us, Excuse me, I swallowed some cinnamon from my tea and it's like it's doing its thing in the back of my throat <clears throat> and it's not fun. Uh, so here's what I found is that whenever we we create this, we actually have noticed that when I try to ask somebody like, hey, where do you want to work on areas of your life? It's hard to pinpoint it. You just go, I don't know. I just, you know, there's an area here and they, what they do is they'll start describing their problems. And the issue with describing your problems is we don't know what the whether it's the symptom or the cause. We just know you have a problem. And so what I like to do is go to the roots and I created something called roots and fruits. It's actually a process we go through in the beginning. It's 10 separate areas. And I start finding out these little pockets that are separate areas of your life that comprise your life. And you noticed over time how some affect certain things. Well, the roots are the things that keep you grounded, provide nutrients for the you and the fruits are what the tree of you of life can create. And so if you got deep roots, you can get the nutrients and you can withstand the storms of life. You don't get blown over. And it allows you to produce amazing fruit. And so for us, what we do is we are we clarify the areas of what they are, what needs to be done, how can you fix them? And then we actually craft a vision. And the vision portion, I'm happy to share, it's, it's really simple. I think that people overcomplicate it. All I do is I say, I need you to do a three-layer like vision for me. Here's what it is. What is it? What does it look like? What does it feel like? And that's it. And then people go, that just seems simple. I know it does. <laughs> it's supposed to. If I make it complicated, you're not going to make it. It's not going to be clear. And what they say, a confused mind doesn't buy. An unclear mind doesn't buy in. Right? So you won't see what you out to it. So what I do is I go, what is it? Um, I want to I have more money. Okay, what does it look like? It looks like when I open my bank account, there's an extra two zeros at the back end of that. Great. What does it feel like? It feels like, like a sense of stability. It feels like a home for my family. It feels like a wife who believes in me. It feels like the ability to pay for the, the education for my kids that I really want them to have. It feels like a chance to see the world. And now, now I have something that's more than just, I want more money. And when we can create that for different areas of your life, and now we know what you're going for and also why, now we've got this different tick and different level of, now you're, you're creating from a place of hope and aspiration of what could be possible for you, as opposed to, I just don't like these problems I have. Yeah. It's interesting to feel into how simple and yet profound that piece of vision can be, but we don't give ourselves permission. Again, I'm hunkering back to the permission piece <laughs> to even just give ourselves the, the permission to go see that permission to go see that. And it's like, it is a, why is there such an aversion to our biggest drawings? Like the things that really like weird, like, yeah, what is that? Because there is, for people like, and you know, having done the work for a while, it's like, oh yeah, what more can I imagine? The momentum sort of builds, like you've been describing through the podcast and you sort of go, okay, I'm looking forward to doing some work because I know that I'm going to break through some other stuff. But when you initially start, you know, there's this, I remember becoming a coach, right? I used to see coaches and I was like, there was this, oh, like there was this turn away thing when really it's everything I ever wanted to be, right? And so there was like this, but that I knew that on a deep down level, but I was always like just sort of, I could feel it energetically, just like, no, nah, that's too good to be true. And blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And yeah, I just wonder why that initial repulsion, like two North Pole magnets, that's kind of that feeling. <laughs> what's, what's up with that? I, I have, so I have an experience. I don't know if this is going to make sense. It's not going to be an answer, but it'll be an experience that makes sense. Played professional football. Loved it, right? I did. And I was really good. 
and I think all of us, we feel good when we do things we're good at. You just do. However you got there, you feel good doing the thing that you, you know. So for me, I, I sucked my first few years of football, but I just kept doing it, and, and I got better, and I got real good, and I got to be one of the best in the world, you know. And so I loved that. And and what I didn't love was the feeling of not being good in something else. That's why a lot of us struggle. We get we get done. We wake up one day and go, I can't feel good like I did because I can't do the thing I did to feel good. Oh, right. And I go, I can never. And so what we do is we try something. We look at something and, and we want that immediate sense of gratification of being good like we used to just have. But we can't. It's like saying, you know what, I, I was in this lot and I had this, this seed I planted and for the last 13, 14, 15 years, I've been watering that thing and I've been pruning the branches and watching it grow. this amazing tree, right? And then someone goes, gate's locked. You can't go in there and, and do that tree anymore. You can't take care of it. Like that was football for me. You can't go, you can't go into that area. Football's done, that tree is, and you go, I got no tree. Oh, what do I do? I'm, I'm a tree farmer. What do I do, right? And you walk across the street, you go, oh, a new plot, new... You put a seed in the ground and you go, all right, you walk away and go, where's my tree? Mm. Well, well, you gotta, you still gotta do the same thing you did for that tree, right? Because that was 30, years. 14, yeah. years, dude. Now here's the thing. You have more insight of how to do it because I know in those 13 years you made mistakes and you figured things out, right? You can build it faster, but you still gotta build the tree. And so I think some people have this sense of like, gosh, I've accomplished this thing and I've done so well. I don't want to have the feeling again of what it's like to start back down here and climb up. I want it now. And so if I look at that and go, God, it's going to be a lot of work. Either I have to accept that I'm ready to do the work or go like, uh, and turn and give myself a reason to be turned off to the idea. That's what I noticed. I had to, I had to give myself a reason to be turned off to like, ah, I don't want to do that. That's stupid. But in my gut, I know oh, I'll be love, be dope to be amazing at that. It'd be really cool to be great at that. But no, nah, I just, oh, I don't have the time for it. Right. We make these excuses to, to pacify ourselves and, allow ourselves to feel okay for not stepping forward when the reality is if that thing was on your doorstep tomorrow and you were amazing, would you do it? Oh, hell yeah. Mm -hmm. Then it's not that you don't want it. It's that you don't want to do what it takes to get it. Yeah. Yeah. That's a fun thought experiment. I play with myself a lot, especially in the business these days, which is, um, is yeah, just going, if I had like a hundred million, 200 million sitting in the bank, what decisions would I make? You know, cause I think there's so much of, yeah, like, exactly what you highlighted. Sometimes I find myself not wanting to do what it takes to get the things that I need to do. Um, and sometimes even doing things that aren't necessary to do as well, because it's like, oh, that's, you know, it's like if I had hundred million dollars, would I be focused on this or would I be focused on this? And I was like, you'd literally just be doing this one thing. And it's like, oh, great. Then I should just double down on that. You know? Do that thing. Yeah, I get it, man. But it's a journey I have to go through to actually get to the point of doing that. And I find that even in that, the thought experiment, like it, takes you back to the cool you ever remember heard of that story about the guy who was at uh, he was a fisherman at like this you know small old you know town somewhere in the middle of nowhere and he's every day and uh, i don't know if i'll, I'll tell it in case somebody on the yeah, face yeah, please, 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 please. but the guy goes you know hey, this, this guy's traveling on vacation he sees this man on a boat coming up in the morning on his morning walk and there's a guy that lives there he's part of the town and he's a fisherman he goes hey what do you do because i'm a fisherman he goes oh wow I catch a lot of fish he goes yeah i do he goes why don't you um you know, so what do you do every day? He goes, I catch the fish and I go into town and and then, you know, I just, I, I sell the fish and I come back home and I take my kid to school and then I take the kid to school. I, I come back, spend time with my wife then I go to lunch with my wife and then pick the kids up after that. And then I just, I, I go back and we you know, make dinner and go back to town, play music. I go home and I get the next day and do, you know, fishing. He goes, oh man, but what if you could like build this amazing, like, you know, fleet of ships and then you never have to fish again and you can go ahead and and, you know, and then and he goes, oh, and then what? He goes, well, then, well, if you had this fleet of ships, you could then, you know, go ahead and, and you know, expand into, you know, this whole new, you know, space of, of uh, expansion of this company. He goes, okay, and then what? He goes, and then you could go out and you could sell the companies and make a bunch of money and get this. Okay, and then what? And he's doing this whole thing over and over. And he goes, and then he goes, and then what? And he goes, I don't know. He goes, what would you do if that was all possible? He goes, you know what? I would, I'd like to just get up in the morning and go fishing and come back and sell the market. And then if I had the time and money, I'd, free, I'd take my kid to school. Like at the end of the day, you're, you build all this stuff up to come back and go, but I just want to do whatever it is I'm doing already. <laughs> It'd be nice to have the money, to be, but if it puts me back in a place I'm at, why am I chasing that big, crazy thing? And, and so even like you said that a hundred million, I'm like, what would I do at a hundred million? You know what would I do at a hundred million? I would just buy a bunch of properties and let somebody run them. And I would still do this. I love talking to people. I love sharing it. I, I 
make really good money now. And it's like, even with that, I, I, I live by neighbors who I know don't make the same amount I do, but they don't know what I make. And I live in a life where like, I thoroughly enjoy that. I get to take my kids to school. I get to hang out with my wife. I get to do this. It's like, yeah, I, yeah, I could do it with a nicer belt, nicer shoes, a nicer car, but I'd still be doing it. And if those things are going to change the experience of me doing it, I don't need them. And I don't even want them. There was a time when I did, but then you see people that get it and I go, that's it's just a, it's a demon you're chasing and it never ends, man. And so I'm not diminishing that because for some people, that is what they want. And I'm not going to, like I said, I'm not going to tell you not to want what you want, right? Love, love what you want, embrace it. But for me personally, I've gone through the journey of like being divorced with my wife, my kid's not here. Like, bro, I'm just here to raise my kids and have a blast doing it, take people on trips, take them through journeys, help their lives. And more money can help some of that. But if it put me in a position to not do this or have a different way of doing it that wasn't enjoyable to my lifestyle, I'm not doing it. Hmm. There's a piece you said early on, which is you found a point in time where you wanted to do what's right, even though it didn't feel good. And I feel like that's really what I'm hearing around the dark work stuff, because I think there is, I say the word mindset, because I can appreciate that, you know, that comes with a loaded sense. But step two, it really feels like it's the time to dive into that. And I can feel that given today's society, the way that we're sort of put together just with information technology at the tips of our fingers and you know I'll be the first to admit like you know the even just the podcast right now where it's at like we've been doing this for six and a half years you know it's doing amazing two million plus downloads like it's just doing its thing yeah and then I've I foray into something new similar to what you said before it's like and it's like oh damn it I could start again <laughs> you know and it's like I'm starting from the bottom and there's all these like expectations but then also all these distractions and I think it's so easy for us to just point the finger at social media and technology and the devices in our hands. But I, you know, and maybe there is some essence of truth in that, but also, you know, I've read some posts where people used to complain about kids reading books because they were burying their heads in books all day, you know, and now we're burying our heads in mobile phones and shit. Right. But all of that to sort of say the, the essence to take the time to do the work, it seems like, you know, you really, evangelizing the the deep workspace um, and that you can't really run away from that if you really want to create something of note, something meaningful in your life that matters to you. 100%. And it may not be a business. It might just mean you work on being a better parent because you and your child haven't had a good relationship for a long time. Like these are not, they're not uh, achievements that are all the things you see on paper. It's just you determining what matters to you and then working towards it, regardless of anybody else's thoughts or ideas, because you know you'll be happy you got it. You'll be proud that you have it, and it'll make your life better. It's, it's, it's weird that in this world we live in, there's so much connection that we are connected to other people's ideas and trying to convince ourselves to buy into them. Like I, I, I've, for years now, stopped convincing myself that I have to have what some of my friends and colleagues have. I got They got a helicopter, but they got a jet. They got this they got a team of 50 like i gotta get that and you go why uh because they have it the hell I go, That's a big <laughs> you sit back and go no i don't i have a great deal of peace and i love my life and i'm i'm happy and i'm in shape and i'm mobile and i'm active like i got to spend this morning working out my wife and then i did you know a little tv spot for some company and i hopped on and coached some clients and then i got guys that i'm, I'm you know giving them donuts and helping out because they're you know working on my house and i want them to feel welcome at my home even though they're working on the outside and then I get to talk about what talk to my son who's up in college doing his stuff about his day and his workouts. And then I'm here with you. And then I got another thing I'm doing after this. And I get my kids from school. I got football practice tonight. Like, dude, my life is packed with joyful things. I love them. But if I was to go and, and follow the suit of the other people, I'd be on a plane. I'd be on a stage every single week. And I'd be all over. And it wouldn't, it wouldn't have the same joy I have. It'd be more success, right? But it wouldn't be the joy. And I would much rather have the joy without the success. Anthony, dark work is coming up out of the ground now. Um, how do people find out more about how to find out more? Yeah, how do they? Yeah. Darkwork.com, man. Just I, I had to go buy the URL because it was one of those things. I'm like, I could have went with like darkwork.co. You know, 
I'm like, no, nah, man, this is a dot com kind of thing. And so went and found the people who had it, negotiated it. It's not cheap. There's none of those things ever are. This person bought the URL in night two thousand and one, right? Like, what made you even think to go? Oh, you know? <laughs> they held it, they held it for a good twenty year stretch and made some money off it, right? So it was worthwhile. But uh but no, I bought it. And so if you go to darkwork.com right now. There's a holding site. You can put your name and email into that. And then uh, as the, the site is currently being done, in fact, I have one more, one of the next six meetings tomorrow with my, I'm looking at my schedule now, my web team. Um, every single piece is being methodically put together between the assessment we had a PhD create, the actual workflow of all the, the apparel we have. We have a whole lot. I mean, there's merchandise. It's, it's a built out monster. It's been, it's going to be almost two years building before we finally launch it in March. And to be part of and aware of what goes on with that, just go to darkwork.com, put your name on the little email list, and we'll get back to you when it comes time. It's not to buy anything. It's just like, hey, we're live. And then when that comes, there'll be a whole bunch of cool, full, like full nuanced stuff. We do consulting, coaching, speaking, apparel, merch, you name it. We're going to do a dark work podcast. So, um, yeah, man, it's it's the thing that I'm excited to to build up for the rest of my life because it's the kind of thing that doesn't change. It's not whimsical. It's not like, um, you know, AI takes over the globe. Like, that's going to have a stint and then it's a move on. But there will never be a time in human history where you don't do dark work. Whether it's you look at people in the past that did it, that were gladiator days, right? Or shoot, the, the Mighty 300, right? They were doing that work, just battling, right? Or and what will be in the future? There's going to be different nuances of what you have to do that, again, is just you. So it's a timeless message that I'm excited to bring out to the world. And I think it's important that um, we just take a moment to acknowledge that absolutely there's a message that you're carrying, but I oftentimes, you know, they say this in philosophy as well, you know, context is king. Um, and, yeah, man, just feeling into, yeah, like we touched on your origin story today. We didn't even get around to, you know, how karmatic it was um, to, yeah, get the football injury and then having to reinvent yourself from that. We touched on it loosely. But man, you, you know, the just the journey that you've been on to rebuild yourself again and again and again and work on the identity piece and get to work in those dark workspaces. Um, we were touching on this a little bit before about the podcast, the message and the messenger. Man, it's um yeah, I wanna thank you for your time and sharing yourself so abundantly here with us today. But really it's it's a lifetime's worth of work that we get to stand on the shoulders of in this conversation today. So just really want to acknowledge you, brother. Thank you so much. Appreciate You're welcome. Here today with us. Appreciate you having me on. Genuinely do. I was uh, I was going to say you were mentioning um yeah the the Kush thing about the message and the messenger. I, I really wanted to tune in there just for myself as a selfish little five minute quick chat with you because I have been struggling a lot recently with my messaging um, because there's so much over the last six years that I've been podcasting on mind body wellness spirituality financial entrepreneurship. And it's, it's, it's all of it, right? Um, ultimately, it started off with live a life you love. Um, but it sounds super wispy when I say that. And I was just like, how does someone like Anthony get so clear on what he's up to in the world? And we were touching on it earlier. Yeah, yeah. Part of it's people presenting it to you. To be honest, it's always hidden within some something. Like if I was a sitter with you and I say, hey, give me your like your origin story. And I just listened to it, I would find it. It's usually how I do it with my clients. I just, and, and it's not that it's something that's a very specific standout thing. Like for me, when dark work came, I didn't find it. I didn't find identity shift. I didn't find dark work. I was on a team call talking about when I'm on stage, I talk about this window of time when I was 15. And I had this moment where I did this like seven months of just work that no one saw. My teammates made fun of me there, you know, but I did it when I show up in the football field the next year, seven months later, I had this mentality of like, that's my football in the air. That is my tackle. I'm going to score. There's, I've done, I, there used to be is I've done too much work in the dark for you to take what's mine in the light. That was the original part of it. This was mine. And so we've now framed this as too much work in the dark to lose in the light because they're like, it's softer. I'm like, I don't think it matters. It's still rugged to an extent. But that was the mentality that's mine. And someone goes, wait, what is it? What is this work in the dark? I go, yeah, you know, it's dark work. They go, wait, dark work? I go, yeah. They go, tell me more. And like, they're like, I like this. And I go, I like it too. And they go, let's see what the world likes. So we started posting things like, they like it, guys. And so we just kind of built it up. And so I didn't, I didn't find it, but it was always there. It was always there. It just wasn't extracted properly. So usually 
When I work with clients, we go through like a process of like tapping into other people's perspectives, how they see us. Like we used to send messages and we still do. It says, hey, if you could extract one thing from my life and plug it into your life to make you better, what would it be? Or one trait for me to plug into your life to make your life better, what would it be? And people will give you things you would never even consider. Like it wouldn't even come into mind. And sure enough, like there's a cool idea there. And so essentially what I would, would you know, have you do is do that. And then sometimes it's just, it's, you need somebody else to hear your stories in ways that you don't hear them. Like there's, there's like one of our clients has this thing about like break the bottle and it, it's tied to him in the military and he was, you know, suicidal and things he did. And there was a moment in time with like this bottle that broke and, and, you know, something was, it was something in there, but we extracted and made that the message break the bottle. Cause it's like, it's like shattering, you know, the previous you to build a better you, right? Like you can shadow melt, you can shatter bottle, melt it down, recycle, make a brand new one, right? Whatever it may be. And so you get to do that. So, but that's a message ripped from his exact life. So it's one simple thing that he gets to make clear with a, a second follow-up statement. You go, oh, I get it. And it becomes an umbrella for everything. So for you, usually it's going to be tucked away in some part of your origin story or your work story that would be a simple thing you can point to, extract the value of it, and then it allows you to expand into all the other parts of your brand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can feel that I'm at that breakthrough. I just need to take the time to... To it's there. I 100% guarantee you it's there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Six years yeah. in, it's there. You just yeah. haven't seen it yet. It's like, a, it's like you know, the Excalibur's, you know, sword at the bottom of the, the, the lake. It's just floating there waiting to get pulled out, but it's down there in the murky depths. I love that, man. And you're still able now to play like a bit of football, like the shoulder's all better now? Like, oh, no. Better I, enough. I'm, I'm an old man, dog. I don't do anything. <laughs> flag football but it's like nowadays it's like my achilles and my knee and my low back the shoulder sucks too my body's all beat up dude i i can sit here and be not in a bunch of pain but there's definitely nights where i'm like oh my arm hurts and like i can't do anything and my achilles hurts my knee like just but I, at this point in my life it's just what comes with the territory having played football you you understand that so now you just take care of it i don't complain i'm not in any kind of constant nagging pain it's just that i'm using it right so I find my balance and it works well. Yeah! Thank you so much for watching this video all the way to its end. Obviously, you absolutely love this podcast and I want to thank you so much for watching this all the way through. Here is another video that's perfectly curated just for you to watch as the next best video to keep your inspiration flowing, to keep you evolving, to keep you yelling. Check it out now.